Hello and welcome everybody. Our distinguished guests today for the reviewer meet reviewed scholarly event organized and hosted by the Anthropological Institute are two scholars, Noel Salazar, the reviewed, and Sanam Rooney, the reviewer. My name is Florentina Badalanova Geller, and I'm a member of the Anthropological Institute. It is my pleasure to be chairing our virtual seminar today, and I'm delighted to welcome our guests, along with the members of the audience who are joining the meeting remotely. I'll need to start by introducing our two speakers. Dr. Noel Salazar is professor in anthropology at Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium. He received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. His research interests include anthropology of mobility and travel, the local global nexus, discourses and imaginaries of otherness, culture contacts, heritage, and cosmopolitanism. He's co-editor of a number of collective monographs, among which Tourism Imaginaries, Anthropological Approaches, published in 2014, and Keywords of Mobility, Critical Engagements, published in 2016. He's an author of uh, Envisioning Eden, Mobilizing Imaginaries and Tourism, uh, and Beyond, published in 2010, and of Momentous Mobilities, published 2018 by Bergam, which will be the topic of our discussion today. He has also published numerous peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on tourism, mobility, and travel. Salazar is a member of the editorial boards of a number of peer-reviewed journals, such as Journal of Sustainable Tourism, Transfers, International Journal of Tourism Anthropology, Applied Mobilities, and Mobility Humanities, the inaugural issue of which has just appeared in January 2022. Salazar is a founding member of the Anthropology of Tourism Interest Group under the Auspices of American Anthropological Association, and a founder of the Anthropology and Mobility Network with the research framework of the European Association of Social Anthropology. He serves as an expert member of the European Parliament Committee on Transport and Tourism for the Cultural Tourism Committee at the International Council of Monuments and Sites and for the UNESCO Network Culture, Tourism and Development. He is also an official consultant for UNESCO and the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Now, the reviewer, Dr. Sanam Rohi, is an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the Center for Modern Indian Studies, University of Göttingen. As a social anthropologist, her work discusses the themes of embodied migration infrastructures transnational resource flows and their ramifications on caste and religious inflected community formations within the Indian diaspora. Within a PhD in anthropology from the University of Amsterdam, her research outputs include the publication of a few book chapters and articles in journals, including Modern Asian Studies, Journal of Contemporary Asia, International Political Sociology and Ethnic and Migration Studies, apart from a co-produced film on diaspora philanthropy. In the period between 2016 and 2018, she was an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at St. Joseph College, Autonomous, Bangalore. Then in the period between 2018 and 2020, she was an associate Marie Curie Coffin Fellow in Max Weber College at the University of Erfurt and an Inter Asia Fellow at the Global and Religional Studies Platform, George August University in Göttingen. 
Rohe is also an associate editor of the Comparative Migration Study Journal. She is a member of the Kolkata Research Group, Feminist Peace Research Network, European Association of South Asian Studies, Bangalore Research Network, International Studies Association. So without further ado, let me invite Professor Salazar to start his seminar presentation. Thank you very much, Florentina, for the very generous introduction. And thank you to the REI for uh, organizing uh, this uh, series, uh, inviting me, inviting the reviewer. And thank, thank you to the reviewer for taking the energy, of course, of reading books. Uh, and I'm very happy that we uh, still focus on, on books and reading books and discussing books, uh, because uh, this is often also where uh, scholarly advancements are being being made uh, so i will try uh, in the next 20 or 25 minutes or so to uh, zoom in, in on some of the aspects of the book assuming that not everybody in the audience has read the book but hoping that after the presentation and the discussion uh, maybe there will be more interest in in reading it uh, but i will try to keep it short because i'm of course more interested in dialogue uh, with with others so what I want to do is uh, basically to go over some, some things and maybe uh, start with uh, clarifying some, some concepts, uh, concepts that I use in the title and that I use in the book and that are concepts that are maybe used in, in different ways. So uh, momentous mobilities. I actually wrote this book. The book is an outcome of two uh, projects. Uh, uh, one that started in 2000, eight till 2011 and then the second one 2011 to 2014 and then it took uh, a bit of time to analyze everything that i had uh, all the data that i had gathered and writing it up so it led to, to this book uh, and i wanted to engage with uh, this field that was emerging mobility studies and interdisciplinary field where uh, anthropologists in the beginning were rather absent, although ironically, this field is very much inspired by earlier anthropological work from the 1980s and 1990s. And so uh, since mobility is a concept that is used in many different ways, I use it in this book in a very specific way. So I'm, I'm excluding lots of mobilities and I also make that clear. Uh, so I'm focusing on on types of movements uh, that are somehow temporary. So, so there's, a, there's a temporal aspect, uh, and this is important. Uh, types of movements that are somehow translocal. So it means that somehow people who uh, are based somewhere uh, temporarily go somewhere else. And uh, it's mobilities that involve uh, some type of travel. And I will explain in the next slide how I uh, understand travel, because also that this is a concept, also that is a concept with which carries lots of different meanings. So in terms of mobility, it's very interesting how um, when we look at the literature on mobility, many of the mobilities that are described are mobilities that are done uh, not because of the mobility. So the mobility serve other purposes. Uh, so, so it's almost never an end in itself, it's, it serves a certain purpose, or at least that's the expectation. And um, I was very interested in, 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 uh, in the book discussing many different types of mobilities where the original intention at least is uh, to leave wherever people were at the moment when they left with the expectation to return. And that uh, whatever travels they had engaged in uh, would lead to a certain enrichment. So, so it, would, it would have a positive effect and so if you frame that within a, a Bourdieu framework, uh, then you can uh, talk about this enrichment as accumulation of symbolic forms of, of capital as a Bourdieu has, has described in, in, in his work. And so this can take different forms. And uh, it's very interesting that people are interested in accumulating capital through mobility uh, for uh, two different purposes. Uh, to actually uh, maybe have that as a starting capital to actually continue moving. So, so it's basically uh, you are mobile, you accumulate capital, and that allows you or that, uh, that makes it more easy to then engage in further movement. So, so it's like a buildup. Uh, 
or uh, there are all kinds of things that you have gained through your uh, mobilities and you can exchange that for other forms. And again, uh, using a Bourdieu framework, uh, expectations that there are economic gains, social gains and or cultural gains. Uh, gains and so and I explain in the book and I illustrate uh, how how that works and how often these expectations are not always met in in practice. Uh, how how uh, there's often a clash between these two. Now I focus also on momentous mobilities to set them apart from uh, daily mobilities. As of course people are engaging on a daily basis in all kinds of movements, and but I, I was interested in mobilities that people themselves deem to be of a certain importance. Uh, and when I say people themselves, it's, it's individuals, but individuals are, of course, always embedded in wider social network societies uh, and cultures. Uh, so this is very much related to processes of, of meaning making. And in the different uh, chapters, I illustrate uh, what those meanings can be. Uh, now, mobility is a rather new concept, and it's, it's borrowing a lot of uh, elements from an older concept, which is, which is travel. Now, it's very interesting when you look at uh, the history of this concept and also the etymological base. Uh, the, word, the word travel is etymologically related to the, uh, to the French and Old English uh, travail or travail, uh, which is uh, all about effort. So, so there's this association that travel, and certainly also in a, in a historical context, travel required effort. Uh, and so, so uh, this is an important thing because the effort is, is uh, deemed to be necessary to be leading them to certain gains. So uh, no pain, no gain. So, so there isn't a certain effort that is expected. Uh, now, the kind of travels that I'm talking about in the book uh, are, of course, uh, possible be because of certain preconditions. And one is motility. Motility is a con concept borrowed from biology. Mm -hmm. It's basically about uh, the capability being able to move. Of course, if you are not able to move, uh, it becomes difficult. And then also the concept of freedom, uh, which is uh, linked to external circumstances. Uh, you can be limited, of course. You can be able to move, but you can be limited externally uh, and from moving. And so this is then linked to uh, regimes of mobility and other concepts that I have developed elsewhere. Uh, when we are talking about travel, when it's not enforced uh, by others, uh, it often involves a conscious choice. And this choice is not necessarily an individual choice. It can be a choice also by a group of people that uh, leads an individual to move. So, so, so it works in, in, in interesting ways. Uh, and then the goal, and this is linked to what I just talked about, uh, transformation, or at least that's the expectation of many forms of travel, that somehow this will lead to a, a transformation. Uh, and I have to stress over and over again, this is the expectation. It's not always how it works out in, in practice. Uh, and so travel in, involves crossing boundaries. And in my book, I talk about many different types of boundaries. So boundaries and borders are not necessarily the same. So it can involve physical borders, but it can also involve, involve other types of more symbolic boundaries and I will explain uh, through the to the different chapters also what I what I mean by that uh, and then so uh, the positive gain that is expected means so so travel is, is a is a concept that uh, has a quite quite a positive ring to it so it's positively valued uh, and so that also means that this is also why this return aspect is, is quite important because it's once you return uh, then also you can get social approval for, for the kind of, of travels that you did. But of course, uh, nowadays it has uh, become a bit more interactive because through social media and internet, uh, we don't have to await the moment of return to actually get social approval. You can get it much quicker. So uh, there's some, some interesting changes taking place also due to uh, technology and social media. So I have, I structured the book in, I, I have, uh, six chapters that I divided rather artificially in two parts, uh, because in reality it's it's all connected in some way or the other. Uh, and I will focusing I will be focusing on uh, the stories that are not my stories in the book. I actually I also talk about my own story, and um, but maybe we can talk about this uh, also in the discussion. But in the presentation, I want to focus on 
the stories that I met while I was doing and the research and how they maybe intersected with, with my own. So in the first three chapters, I focus on life worlds that I uh, researched that were very far from, from my own. Uh, and I start with, with uh, Chile. And I start actually with, with an example where the stress is very much on immobility. Uh, and I wanted to do this to actually make it very clear how mobility and immobility as concepts are very much related and actually parts of the same coin. And so uh, in that chapter, I actually focus, I, I did research in Chile and uh, as part of this uh, larger project where I was interested in uh, how, where people from a certain country are migrating to or traveling to uh, and, and what their motivations are. And actually in Chile, I was very soon confronted with the fact that uh, there's a lot of resistance against uh, leaving Chile. So, so, we're, so we're talking here about Chileans who, who are talking about uh, going elsewhere uh, and, and, uh, and very much using this trope of the end of the world, uh, which is something that uh, people were bringing constantly up, but which is also very much present in the popular culture in Chile. And Chile as a country, of course, has certain places that we also associate with ends of the world and I have included here the three most extreme ones uh, that, that we also include with the end of the world. So this idea that an end of the world is a place that is, must be hard to reach. Uh, and so the contrast can of course not be greater when you, when you uh, arrive in Chile and you walk around, particularly in the cities, you see like you see in many places in the world, you see all these elements that are pointing to well, uh, influences from, from elsewhere. So even if it's, if it's in the imaginary of people, the end of the world, then many people must have uh, reached the end of the world because there's a lot of influence from many different places. And this, this pictures here just, just uh, show that. So there's a big contrast between the reality and, and how Chile, like many parts of the world have become very globalized and very much interconnected with other parts. And then how people think and how people rationalize and explain uh, also their ideas about uh, immigration, because I was very much interested not in how they think about people coming to Chile, but uh, how Chileans think about uh, going elsewhere on a temporary or uh, longer basis. And uh, what struck me very much is, although Chile is not an island. Uh, because of these ideas of the end of the world, uh, they definitely have an island complex. Uh, they behave as if they were I islanders, uh, stuck behind the Andes, uh, and using that also as, an, as a kind of an argument uh, that it is hard if you are at the end of the world, it, it's also hard to move from there. Uh, so, 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 so this is a kind of an uh, an element. Uh, I also in the, in, in the chapter write about how a lot of these uh, rationalizations are linked also to the, the, the history and the recent history of Chile of, of the, uh, the period of dictatorship and the fact that many Chileans were actually forced uh, to uh, leave the country. Uh, so this period of, of, of exile, uh, which has also uh, had a very important influence in how people think about emigrating, uh, but also then how, how there is this, and I was interested in, in because in many other countries, there's this uh, stress on, on mobility and how mobility helps you to, to build up this, this capital. And so, uh, so when this is not the case, how, how does that work then? And I was very uh, struck by the fact that, so although Chileans have this idea of, uh, you know, we, uh, we don't have to move, we, we have it good here, they are very much influenced by other frames of reference. Uh, Europe, in, in terms of, of uh, cultures, way, uh, the cultured way of, of, of uh, behaving, but then also uh, the US as really uh, the example of how you realize dreams and material dreams. Uh, and then how there's a lot of uh, dreams and aspirations that are clearly in, being imported from, from elsewhere. Uh, and, and so uh, the development of a kind of cosmopolitanism that is not necessarily then based on, on, on mobility. And if it's based on mobility, it, it's, it's rather very short term. So tourism, very short, short tourism. So, so uh, going out uh, quickly and returning quickly because it's uh, 
Chile is a society where basically uh, in order to keep your social position, it's good to actually not to be gone. Because if you are gone a long time, then you, you, you lose your social position. And it's very important that you actually uh, maintain because Chile is very, like many countries in Latin America, is, is quite layered. There's a lot of inequalities. And so uh, there's not a lot of social mobility. Uh, and, 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 and that's why it's so important to actually to keep your, your networks going. So this is, this is an example of immobility. And I'm going very quickly now because otherwise we'll have no time for discussion. Uh, second chapter is about Indonesia and it's about a very different type uh, of, well, here it's the focus is on, 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 on cultures and actually uh, historical examples also of how uh, culturally important forms of mobility that have existed for a very long time are actually still in place, but how, of course, throughout uh, the ages, they have changed. And I, I focus in particularly on one practice, Merantau, which was actually the practice in one island, but it, it has become a more general practice of actually sending, and in the beginning it was sending out boys, it was very gendered, sending out boys, they had to leave the village in order to have an experience outside the village, um, get to know the world, uh, the world uh, work also get some work experience. And if they came back, uh, then they were deemed to be uh, ready to uh, marry, start a family and take up responsibilities. And you can see how this old form of mobility is, has, has been transformed and has become now uh, a kind of uh, generalized thing and has, has very much become linked to a kind of labor migration. But what we see is that through the history and particularly the very recent history that the gender roles ha have been reversed. So where in the beginning uh, women were excluded from these practices, you can actually see that since the Meranto became linked with a migration uh, and that there is a lot of demand in the migration for, for female migrants, that actually it's now, uh, there's a lot of young Indonesian women who actually participate in this. And so I talk in the, in the chapter about uh, what that does and what kind of opportunities it, it gives women and how it, it changes structure and how the old forms are still present but are, are clearly uh, transformed in, in quite interesting ways. Uh, then another chapter, uh, Tanzania, so you see I'm, I'm shifting here continents, uh, uh, where actually I focus on, on Maasai and I did a lot of research on Maasai within the context of tourism. Uh, and so the Maasai are this uh, very, it's a very well-known uh, ethnic group uh, associated, of course, many people talk about uh, the nomads. Uh, and the nomads are, of course, it's one particular group of the Maasai because not all the, the Maasai are nomadic. It's the people who are, who are actually have to be nomadic because of the cattle. Uh, and so I actually use this chapter to actually reflect a bit on this figure of the nomad, uh, which is a figure of, of mobility and all the contradictions that are involved in how people also uh, imagine nomads. Uh, whoops. Ah, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, this, uh, this just flipped here. Let me go back. Uh, so I was talking about... Here we are. We are not seeing your slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My oh, slides. Okay, cool. I'm bringing them back up. Yeah. Okay, they were gone. They were kind of nomadic, I guess. Uh, so how basically there's a lot of imaginaries that are also uh, kind of contradictory. Uh, so on the one hand, associating nomads with, with freedoms, people who are actually often working outside of, of regulations and that have a lot of freedom, but also being associating them with primitiveness, uh, irresponsible people, rude people, uncultured people, and how actually also these this imaginaries play out in, in tourism and in how foreigners uh, have depicted uh, nomads like the Maasai and how actually this these depictions have had a huge influence on how the Maasai see also themselves and how they have actually actually changed. Uh, and so I put this picture here uh, upside down to actually uh, point out the fact that the, their world has also been turned upside down. And it's, it's, it's a lot due to this uh, outside imaginaries of who they are and who they should be. Uh, 
how that actually has also influenced the way that they actually also move around uh, and, and how, how it has created new movements in, in the sense that they have been following also the, the tourism streams, the pictures actually taken from Zanzibar where the Maasai uh, usually were not uh, there, but they, they have been following the tourism streams and how actually this, uh, the tourism mobilities have, have influenced and have big, and this is very ironic, uh, the Maasai who, who are imagined as nomads more, more sedentary because they are staying where, where the tourists are staying. Uh, and how that has created a lot of uh, issues related to how also they, they envision their, their social mobility and, and what kind of lives they can have and, and uh, whether they are willing to play the Maasai, that, uh, the role that is expected by, by, by others. And then in the last three chapters, I actually bring the experiences and the discussions uh, back to Europe, which is uh, the region where, I, where I'm living. And I'm focusing on three different types of mobility to, uh, related to three different fields. So uh, the first one is the educational field, where I focus on mobilities in the, the context of education. The second is labor. And the third is, I call it life's pilgrimage. It's about uh, things that are outside the realm of education and labor and more related to meaning making so uh, from pilgrimage to uh, forms of tourism that are about meaning making and so the first one is about education where i talk about uh, the histories and 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 the older forms of uh, educational mobilities in europe so going from uh, the grand tour as is illustrated here which is quite well known and and has been well researched to the compagnon which is uh, actually a tradition that still exists in France. It existed all over Europe where actually it were uh, people who were wanting to learn skills and had to actually travel around to learn from different masters uh, the skill. Uh, and so, so these are all historical forms of uh, educational mobilities that have influenced the current forms as we know them. And so I discuss also the Erasmus program, which is one of the most uh, successful EU programs uh, that exists and where the budget is always in, increasing. Then I move to uh, labor and I, of course I'm, I'm building up here because oftentimes the educational mobilities serve as, as like tasters also to motivate people to engage in labor mobilities uh, where of course uh, you have a lot of different issues and I'm focusing here on, on the European context and also on I am I'm critically, critically analyzing also how uh, a lot of EU policies want to actually, they want to move uh, people around. And so the EU is actually based on four pillars of mobility. And the last pillar and the, the one that is most difficult to implement is this movement of persons. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm discussing in that chapter a bit, uh, what is at stake here and what the, what the EU is trying to achieve and uh, also why there is maybe uh, resistance to that. But I'm sure that in the discussion we will come back to these issues. And I'm also linking that to uh, popular culture where there, is, where there are commentaries about uh, all kinds of, of labor uh, mobilities. And I'm focusing a lot on not on the what many people call low skill, but which I find an awful term, but more, more like the, uh, the people who are uh, highly mobile and who are constantly going uh, flying up and down and, and, and what that does also socially. Uh, and then as a little uh, side note, but maybe we can talk about this in the discussion also how, how important uh, mobility has been also in, in establishing and becoming respected and accepted as an anthropologist. This idea of doing fieldwork and doing fieldwork elsewhere as, an, as a necessary condition to become accepted as an anthropologist. And how also, of course, uh, this has changed uh, throughout uh, the years. And then the last chapter uh, is, is basically about different forms of, of meaning making where I, I basically start from the idea of the pilgrim, which is an, an, an old figure of mobility. And I actually go back to the uh, original meaning of pilgrim. Now, when we think of pilgrim, we think of pilgrim in, in a religious context, but actually the uh, the etymological meaning is, is much wider. Uh, so it's a traveler who leaves his or her native land and is 
the stranger in the lands to, to which he or she travels. And so this is a much wider uh, concept that is actually very interesting to uh, compare to all these different types of, of travels that I'm describing in the book. Uh, and so again, also historically in, in pilgrimage, uh, it's very much about this idea of transformation and whether you can actually transform uh, by not moving at all, like uh, people who, who are living in a cloister in a monastery and not move at all versus people who go on, on a pilgrimage. Uh, and then also this idea of uh, the destination versus the, the journey and how in pilgrimage, the destination for some people have be, has become much less important and it's really much more about the journey. And I discuss many different examples. One of the examples I discuss is uh, how uh, people who visit Machu Picchu, Machu Picchu for a long time was visited just by people going to the site and visiting the site and that was it. And how in the last 20 years, there's a, a lot more focus on the journey. And so like walking the Inca trail or at least parts of the Inca trail as a very important part of visiting Machu Picchu and this arguments that you can really only experience Machu Picchu if you, if you arrive at the site after having uh, walked. Uh, and so, so, so these ideas of the journey being very important as part of the, uh, the kind of mobilities that people are, uh, are engaged in. Since I, I see that time is running out quickly, this is, I think, one of the last slides. Uh, a couple of things that I end uh, the book with are uh, yeah, this, this very important linkages uh, that travel uh, is always imbued with, with meaning. And I think as anthropologists, it's very important to try to, to grasp where that meaning is, is coming from. Uh, so you have all kinds of elements, the political, economic, social, cultural, and how actually the individual choices are very clearly always also influenced by uh, choices that are uh, broader, uh, belonging to, to broader groups, uh, be it family groups, uh, the society, cultures, uh, and how, how this idea of, of transformation is actually uh, present in so many forms of, of travel, but then again, how uh, the transformation that is expected is uh, in many cases also uh, not realized or uh, is very short lived. Uh, and I will end with. Uh, a little quote to uh, get the discussion going and I give now the floor to the reviewer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noel, for laying out the key themes and concepts you have used in this fantastic book. I think you've done a wonderful job of actually going through each of the chapters. So I think those of us who may not have read the book, I certainly have, uh, will get a good grasp of what this book is about. As someone working on migration and mobilities, I really want to reiterate what a pleasure it was to review your book. And I want to thank the J uh, REI, especially Hanin and Ted for giving me this wonderful platform. There were quite a few questions that I thought if I would get a chance to discuss with you, I would, and here we are. So what I will do is that first, I will briefly go through a few points I've covered in my review, trying not to sort of repeat what you've already said. And before we launch into discussions and reflections upon your book. I will begin with what you began in your book with, that is the preface, where you've opened it with the story of your first trans transatlantic trip to Mexico for a wedding, where you asked to meet a missionary who traveled to Rome occasionally, a city in which you, the, the missionary was supposed to be working soon. A year later, quite unexpectedly, you, Salazar, meets him, not in Rome, but in the missionary's hometown, Kampala. The story lays the foundation for momentous mobility's main theme, a partly reflective and partially ethnographic account of, more ethnographic rather, account of the multiple possibilities, limits, and meanings of travel and mobility. At its crux, the monograph attempts to answer why and how people move and how mobilities vary in intense outcomes and processes from the mundane to the sacred, from rational decisions to changes in personal and family fortune, through to travel as a rightly passage, Noel attempts to analyze mobility as a contemporary, all-encompassing phenomenon. The monograph quite ably suits together empirical evidence with theoretical arguments, as well as personal anecdotal vignettes, 
to offer a panoramic account of the different constitutive elements of mobility that structure human sociality. The monograph in introduction theorizes mobility as a socio-cultural assemblage where the older dichotomies of flows and fixities have become redundant. While mobilities and of course its other and intricately tried immobilities are regulated, facilitated or constrained by social, economic and political structures, they also engender transformative potential making border crossings momentous. As a spatio-temporally expansive analysis of travel, be it for higher education, work, adventure, pilgrimage, or leisure, all of which you've touched upon in your presentation, each of the six chapters of the book explores different dimensions of human movement. But it's not something new. You draw upon older literatures on ritual, kinship, travel, and pilgrimage, and weave your own personal accounts within the chapters, empirical and within the chapters with empirical and analytical tracks, making for a complex reading of mobility from within and without. As you've already mentioned, it's divided into two sections, and I will briefly tell what they are. The first part, imagining mobility, makes for a compelling read. And for me, it was really wonderful as somebody interested in different forms of mobilities. It made for an absolutely fantastic, compelling read. The ethnographic accounts span locations, as you've already pan, uh, pointed out, and offers sharp insights on how geographies are entangled with the histories of their people, which in turn inflect travels, meanings, and imaginaries. So they can materialize themselves in socio-cultural practices specific to each region. For Chileans in exile, for example, or Indonesian students or Maasai nomads, for instance, movement to redefine the meaning of home, elsewhere, and themselves in the process. Uh, briefly, talking about the second part, which is enacting mobility, Salazar turns the gaze to Europe, a continent whose decades-long debate on migration finds or keeps finding a new lease of life every few years. It seems never to stop. Here, Salazar explores the long and short-term cycles of mobility within the continent, turning a critical gaze upon the EU mobility policies and practices. Your chapters look at labor mobility and student mobility, respectively. Policymakers idealize a small group of hypermobile Europeans leading expat lives and create a reproducible template for others to follow, which you seem to be quite critical of. Policy strategies around EU life learning programs, for instance, or even EU mobility partnerships are formulated to generate academic and mobility capital, which you find akin to other forms of Burdusian capital. Mobility strategies often enforced by policymakers are remarkably contrasted in the contemplative last chapter, which examines the ontological questions of being and belonging through the lens of pilgrimage. The conclusion and your last few slides reiterate that again, theory of human mobility perhaps is not possible. And, and anthropology of mobility needs to problematize the assumptions, values, or imaginaries attached to human mobility and to examine how these are negotiated or contested. And I think it is this last thought that I want to take forward in the discussions that we will have today in the next 25 minutes or so. So I want to begin by asking you a question about what inspired you to write this particularly unique book where you've juxtaposed personal musings alongside rigorously researched work. And if I may add, also tell us a little bit about why you sort of separated temporary mobilities with other forms of mobility like migration, for instance, in this book. Noel. Okay, thank you. And thank you for, uh... As I said again, for, for reviewing the book and for now also being uh, willing to engage in a further discussion, uh, which I very much look forward to, and maybe not a discussion, maybe an exchange of ideas is yes, a better way of putting it. Yes. Um, so, so what inspired me? Um, so let me tell you that uh, I actually, uh, I came from a background of doing research on, on tourism. I actually did my PhD uh, on, on tourism. And... Uh, as often happens, uh, your, your academic track is often set by opportunities and challenges that you are facing. And so I landed my first job, my first uh, 
day job after uh, you know the the PhD in in a research center that was focused on on migration, and there I was with my background on tourism and then having to deal with and to integrate myself with the group of scholars that was focusing on migration. Uh, and I found that mobilities as, as, an, as, an, as a concept, as an overarching concept was an interesting way of actually doing so. Mm -hmm. Because uh, some of the things what uh, mobility scholars are trying to do is actually by, by breaking down uh, those uh, categories. So, so by not talking about migrants or talking about tourism, but by, by looking at what are the processes that all these uh, people crossing boundaries are, are facing. It's, it's just of, of offering an additional lens to, to what, what uh, people have been traditionally doing in tourism studies and in, and in migration studies. And so uh, the, the research projects on which this, uh, this book is based were very much aimed at exploring and playing with this and, and see uh, what this uh, what this mobility concept was doing? The book is also published in in this book series uh, that was launched uh, by Burkhan. It's called World World Worlds in Motion, uh, where, where it's basically uh, trying to reflect very critically on this anthropology of mobility. And so the book series is also in collaboration with the Anthropology and Mobility Network, which is an EASA network. And so I took this book really as an opportunity to. Uh, reflect on, on the one hand on, on, on this concept and bring a lot of different projects that had been engaged in trying to bring it all together in, 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 in one book on the one hand. And then on, on the other hand, also uh, playing a little bit and uh, exploring different ways of, of writing. That's why the writing style, it's maybe a book that is hard to categorize because I mix uh, different styles and things which maybe some people don't like. Uh, but I find it an interesting way. I was actually also teaching on, on, on writing. I was giving a seminar on writing. And so I was playing a bit around and, and uh, test, testing, you know, what is, what is possible. And I was very curious also to see how it would be received. So, so that's basically what, what inspired me. <clears throat> I think the end product was really wonderful and very unique. I wish we could write more like you have written. So, um, from here, perhaps we could move into the next point of discussion that I have listed here, you know. So uh, we all talk about, you know, with accelerated global interconnections, about mobility and migration also. And it seems like there's too much emphasis on mobility and not a lot of attention is directed to those who do not move. Sometimes we are blindsided by that. And not just, I'm not talking about only those who do not move out of, uh, but are forced to, I mean, who are not, who are still behind, they are forced to stay behind, sorry, but those who choose to stay. And I think the number would easily, uh, you know, be much more. You have addressed this issue of immobility in your book. And again, today here, perhaps uh, you could reflect on why many scholars of migration and mobility take this myopic view that persists and how we as scholars of mobility and migration perhaps can address this in our work. Be attentive to this rather. Yes, thank you. That, that's, a, that's a rather complex question. And it's true that there has been a lot of focus uh, on mobility. And the question would also be uh, in, in how far uh, the whole coronavirus crisis has, has changed that or has, has made people reflect and become more aware of immobilities. I'm sure it has had a certain impact. And so it's important, of course, to know that the book was published before that. Uh, so. If I would now uh, rewrite it, I would certainly include reflections on that uh, because it's important. In terms of mobility and immobility, I think that anthropologists were among the first to actually point out uh, that, you know, yeah, there's all this focus on, 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 on mobility, but there's also, you know, uh, there's this other side of the coin and, and, and pointing out that th there is this societal value in, in many parts of the world, uh, mobility is seen as a good thing, but it's not in all part and, and, and definitely not from a historical point of view, you see it's like a pendulum, uh, you know, where at, at certain moments uh, staying put is, is seen as, as more important than uh, moving around. Uh, the, the current focus on mobility is very much linked, of course, to, to capitalism, to globalization, also this, the, the flexibility in terms of, of labor. Uh, and this is why also uh, all around, as you see, you know, there's a, this societal commentaries that it's good 
to move and to be flexible. Uh, but there's, of course, the, there's also there's a lot of uh, resistance against that. And, and it's very interesting. And I talk also about this uh, when we're talking about the EU, there's so much discourse. But when you look at the numbers, the majority of, of Europeans in terms of uh, labor and everything are, are not all that mobile. Uh, you know, it's uh, and, and so there's a big gap between all, all the discourses and all the the, the valorization versus the actual practices. And I think th this is very important to to keep in mind uh, in terms of uh, migration and mobility. It's very interesting how these fields are uh, have have developed very independently and how there's also a certain kind of hostility almost. Uh, there's a lot of migration scholars who, who don't like and who don't engage much with, with uh, mobility uh, scholarship. And it's also because it's only partially overlapping. I always say laughing, laughingly that actually most uh, migration scholars don't deal with mobility uh, because actually the elements that they are mostly interested in in terms of migration have to do with, with, with uh, processes happening either before the actual movement or when people have moved. Uh, you know, issues of integration and mm -hmm. uh, and then that, of course, comes with the assumption that once people have migrated, that, that then migrants are not mobile anymore, which is, of course, very problematic uh, because, of course, uh, migrants can still move once they have gone from A to B. They can. And, I mean, there's a lot of other movements, but there seems to be this this assumption, which is, of course, also related to political discourse that mm -hmm. the big problem we have with migrants is that they come from elsewhere and they come here where we are and they come here to stay and that's what the problem is mm -hmm. uh, which is disregarding the fact that uh, there's a lot more mobilities actually at play mm -hmm. and is this the reason why you chose to not address the issue of uh, you know migration in in its uh, self but uh, look at more temporary forms of mobilities well i didn't in the book i didn't talk a lot about uh, migration also because that would require much more it would require actually a second book and because mm -hmm. there's a lot to mm -hmm. be said and to be unpacked uh, and so that's why i i left kind of a little bit as i talk about migration but it's not it's not the main thing because it's yeah, it would require a lot more unpacking mm -hmm. yes of course mm -hmm. So, well, you've already you know highlighted the very complex relationship between mobility and immobility and in your book also you've talked about the interplay between structure and agency and it's important to note that it does not really follow any kind of template as such so could you tell us and the audience with a few examples how can we carefully disaggregate the many ways in which perhaps structure agency interaction could produce mobilities and immobilities perhaps with a few examples mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting how uh, this this binary of structure and agency is is something that has been around in scholarship. Has there's a lot that has been written about it, uh, and in, in in maybe in many different uh, ways and using many different concepts, not necessarily structure and agency, but it's often coming down to to the same question. So how much freedom, or maybe how much. Uh, how much can can people decide, and how much is uh, is being also decided and and limited or hindered or or, or, or being pushed uh, gently or not so so gently by more societal uh, structures? Uh, and one of the things uh, I didn't use those those concepts. I don't talk about structure and agency, but but in every chapter, it's very clear that those forces are at work in 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 actually different ways, uh, and. Uh, it's it's very hard in in all the research uh, that you do to pay equal attention to both because sometimes yeah the evidence is is pushing you in paying much more attention to the structure or much more attention to the agency uh, although of course in, in in everything that we research both are actually present uh, but it's not always that that visible what what i think becomes very clear in in my examples is that uh, this idea, when we talk about agency and, and when, we, when we limit that to individual agency, uh, that it's, and this is of course where, where we have these influences depending on, on our own positionality and, and where we are from. Uh, you can very clearly see that a lot of Western scholarship has this idea, you know, this, of course, this, this idea of individualism and so that the individual has, has freedoms. 
and and of course you clearly see that in many cases where people think that they are making individual choices those choices are maybe not all that individual they are all always to a certain extent embedded in and, and influenced by uh, the social networks that people uh, belong to or want to belong to. Uh, and I think it all boils down to the fact that in the end, we uh, humans are social social animals. And so uh, even, even if we think that uh, our individual freedom is important, uh, we also want to have recognition, social recognition from what we do. And that means that we yeah, we want to uh, have approval from, from the groups that we want to belong to or belong to uh, by uh, default. And I think in my different examples in the book, it's clear that this is always at play, but, but in many different ways. Uh, yeah, yeah. You have not been explicit about agency, but you do use, about, you do use the term structure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, implicitly, yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so now moving away from structures and agency, the debate is, it doesn't seem to resolve. Your book contemplates on the meanings of travel and mobility, but while reading it, I kept thinking about the possibility of travel and movement, and it's just a thought, can it be devoid of meaning making? Are we actually, you know, forcefully attributing some meanings to things that may be chaotic and whose meanings may be very difficult to comprehend? Yeah, so, so I... I called it momentous mobilities, and I explained also that uh, it's, mo it's momentous because people attribute uh, a certain value to it. And so that means that people, of course, engage in certain movements and certain, and certain travels that they don't find uh, momentous. Uh, and, and of course, there's many examples of that. It, it goes from, from uh, the, the, the kind of travels that people are engaged in when they are going to their work. And so some some people have short commutes but some people have long commutes it really travels uh where they wouldn't attribute a lot of uh, meaning to that you know because it's something that they do and so there is this expectation that the kind of uh things that i describe the kind of examples uh there is the expectation uh sometimes by the people sometimes by their by their uh social networks or by society that is move that is uh mobilities are momentous uh, and mm -hmm. sometimes there is there is a gap there between what, what what is expected either by the people engaging in those mobilities or by uh, the wider society and then the actual experiences and i also describe that uh, and it is also sometimes because there is that gap uh that's uh the gap is underreported, and I give this example of the uh, exchange students in in Europe, where for actually for a very long time there wasn't much research on the Erasmus student experience and 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 whether that was actually all that positive. I mean, the the, the assumption was uh, a student exchange is per definition a good and a positive thing, and you basically you give you you get credit and you get extra credit and you get social approval for the mere fact of doing it, uh, whether, whether you learn something or whether it, it has added value, that's often not questioned. And so that also means that uh, for a very long time, there was not much research on that. And that actually also many people that had a not so positive experience had also not a lot of means of sharing that anywhere because it was not mm -hmm. expected, you know, and, and, and uh, and, and this is now slow, slowly changing. And so, and so this is related to how there's this expectations, you know, these expectations that then uh, also shape the, the, the experience and shape how people afterwards or during report about these experiences. Mm. Yeah, and related to this last point, you know, I mean, although in your presentation, you've already alluded that such a relationship may not exist in reality, but in a lot of literature, we do see the tendency to see travel or even mobility or even migration for that case as transformative and perhaps is, you know, naturally intertwined. Like if there is mobility, there has to be transformation mm -hmm. and something which inflects the subjectivities and selfhoods of those who engage in these practices. But surely not all mobility can be transformative, or could they be? Would, would you agree with this kind of a formulation? What would your take be on this? I would totally agree that not, not all mobilities are transformative, not even the ones that, that are sometimes termed transformative. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's, many, there's many instances where 
the transformation doesn't materialize or when the transformation is actually uh, very short lived. And I actually, I, I teach a course on anthropology of travel and I always use a documentary that was made by, by a colleague of us. It's a Swiss uh, anthropologist who made the documentary called Common Roads. And in that documentary here, he basically follows a young woman who goes on a backpacking trip uh, to Southeast Asia. And he follows another young woman who goes uh, as a pilgrim on the Camino to uh, Santiago de Compostela. And so it's very interesting when comparing these two that uh, although the framing is very different, uh, the expectations of these two people are very similar and the processes that they are going to are entirely similar. Uh, and so what is interesting is that in the documentary, the documentary maker follows uh, these two women from, from the, the preparation stage uh, and then going with them on the trip and then also to one year afterwards. Uh, so actually the post trip. And the documentary starts uh, with the two girls who are sitting on a coach and they are reflecting on the documentary. They, they've just seen the documentary and they are reflecting. And so the documentary maker is asking them, so, so yeah, in the documentary you speak about, you know, this, uh, so, and this transformation and how this trip changed you. And so and now one year after the trip, so where are we? And then they, they both have to recognize that, well, you know, um, yeah, the, the transformation was short-lived. Because mm -hmm. as soon as we arrived back home and then, you know, we had to readapt to the, the rhythm of every day. And, and so all the transformation that we had undergone was actually undone quite rapidly. And then the documentary maker asks, okay, and so, so what do you do then about this? And then one of the girls says, well, then we travel again. I'm leaving next week. Fantastic. I wish, I wish to see this documentary. Maybe I'll take the link from you. Uh, from subjectivities and transformation, I think we could move to policies. So in your book, you have adopted a critical lens of the UI policy strategies that emphasizes on mobility and create uh, what you say as hypermobile group of co uh, cosmopolitan EU citizens. But not all partakers in EU mobility programs are from within the EU. And for many international students and scholars, the significance of such mobility programs can be very far reaching. Would you consider your critique of these policies um, as addressing this question, or would you see that these are two different constituencies that, that needs perhaps different analytics? No, no, this is a very interesting question, and it's not, not something that I that I have addressed in the book and that I could have. Maybe because I was too much focused on, on, on uh, the policies themselves, and the policies themselves actually don't take these this groups too much into account. Uh, those policies were also developed not with the aim of increasing the mobility of, of uh, non-EU uh, mm -hmm. students or staff or, or mm -hmm. other people involved in, in education. But of course, these people have increasingly become part of it and are increasingly also shaping the experiences of the Europeans participating in it. Because, you know, it, it has become a very international uh, kind of enterprise. I'm thinking also of this like Erasmus Mundus programs where per definition the student body is very international including a lot of non-EU uh, people but also the places that they're going to it's going beyond the EU mm -hmm. uh, and I think the the policies have not and, and the ways they have been envisioned and uh, have not catched up with the realities uh, and, and the realities are that indeed uh, there's other groups that the original policies didn't really think of and consider and that actually uh, are using this maybe in very different ways and where actually also the meaning and the value of these mobilities carry a very different weight uh, and this is something that would be very uh, worthwhile to actually research mm -hmm. uh, because again it's something that it's maybe not being looked into to with, with too much detail because the the policies were not actually intended to include these groups in the first place and it's uh, actually again so the reality is there but it, it, it takes some time so maybe yeah as researchers we should take the lead and, and point to uh, yes. these issues. Yeah which, which wants me to say that you know I'm really interested in doing STEM students mobility from South Asia to Europe. Yeah. Okay. Um, and finally, we cannot not talk of the pandemic when we are talking about mobility. You've already spoken about it. 
but I want to here ask you something that, that is going on a different uh, area, a theme on which, so the pandemic and mobility is something that has produced so much work. I mean, in the last two years, it's surprising that people have already written so much about it. Um, so one thing that I want you to perhaps turn your attention to is how beyond the whole idea of visa regimes and hierarchy of movements, a point that uh, we've addressed in our work in certain ways, you've definitely addressed it in your book, uh, COVID forces us to reckon with the other possibility where the regul where, you know, mobility uh, is regulated by the state of its own citizens. And we see the manifestation of that in, in many different ways continuing to this date. And the best example right now would be China. So states have proactively prevented their own nationals from moving or have put graded and sometimes debilitating restrictions on them. So how should we take this into consideration in the future when we actually theorizing mobility? It's always like somebody's coming from the outside, but you know, here is something, a lot of things are happening within. So how could we take that into consideration when we theorize mobility? Yeah, one of the things, of course, and this is again how scholarship is being organized, is that there are these divides. Uh, also, when people are studying migration, they're usually studying international migration, uh, or at least that's a very different field from people who, who would study uh, domestic migration. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so one of the things, of course, that uh, COVID-19 and all the measures that were taken has made people, in including scholars, much more aware of is that, yeah, there are uh, all these rules and regulations uh, that are around and that actually have been around and were uh, implemented to uh, other categories. And now all of a sudden we, we and we can be whoever, but many people were realizing that all of a sudden I'm also confronted with these rules and regulations, mm -hmm. not maybe realizing that uh, other groups have been uh, confronted with these rules and regulations for actually quite a long time, you know, mm -hmm. and it's... Uh, and this has been to me also so, somehow a bit uh, disturbing that uh, many people have looked at uh, whatever was happening uh, in COVID, COVID times uh, through their own uh, lenses and too much from their own positionalities. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's clear, of course, that a lot of people and, and like uh, definitely middle class Mm -hmm. to which actually many academics uh, believe have, have all of a sudden been, been confronted with all these limitations. Uh, but of course, there are other people that have had these limitations for a long time. And what was very ironic is that where a lot of middle class people were not allowed to move around, that of course, there were a lot of people that were allowed to move around. And these were migrants that were needed. You know, there were a lot of migrants that were in, in these uh, jobs that were deemed uh, necessary or essential essential jobs and these people were actually allowed or sometimes gently forced to move around because they needed the labor force mm -hmm. there's also the fact that uh, there were a lot of people uh, with with re with resources and networks that were uh, actually able to to bypass a lot of uh, rules and regulations i actually checked also during the first lockdowns i mean the the amount of private jets flying around uh, was was quite impressive and and these are things that have gone a little bit unnoticed because people were so much yeah uh, dealing with their own uh, situations that maybe we didn't pay enough attention as researchers to actually how very differently these corona times have been experienced by different groups of people in different parts of the world yeah yeah i think now i mean we have to always take into consideration the world before and after the pandemic and how it has changed and it will unravel over the years. Mm -hmm. I think we are very close to the end of our time. And perhaps now I think uh, we could ask Florentina to step in and take questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Noel, for this wonderful discussion. Thank, thank you, you, Sanam, for your stimulating questions. Pleasure. And thank you for this dynamic discussion, both of you. It was really fascinating following it. So um, now uh, the time has come for, for questions. Uh, so far, I don't see uh, any questions formulated. Um, so then perhaps I will start with an opening uh, question. Uh, uh, what is the impact on the field? which you hope this book will have. 
Noel and uh, Sanam. So who should answer first? <laughs> Maybe you can go. Yeah. Perhaps um, you. Yeah, this is an interesting question because if we talk about impact on the field, of course, the uh, the first thing would be to define what the, what the field is and and what the audience is. And uh, I'm an anthropologist, and so so is the field anthropology. Uh, I actually don't know. It's very interesting. I've I've uh, in in the last couple of years, I've engaged in a lot of interdisciplinary. Uh, talks and I think uh, this is also important so uh, I wouldn't know what the field is but I think it's important that we as anthropologists whatever insights we have and and we can share that we definitely don't don't keep them to our, ourselves that we uh, at least engage with other scholars but maybe also uh, beyond that that we that we engage with uh, society and I've actually taken this book out and I've given talks to all kinds of groups uh, starting here in my own country, I've been talking uh, to um, students, uh, and then I focused, of course, on the students' uh, exchanges. I've also been talking to groups of, of retired people. Uh, I've been talking to all kinds of groups in society because I want I want just to see how how they actually uh, react to these ideas and 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 uh, whether they actually agree or or disagree. And I think this has been very very informative uh, to me because it has added a lot of layers I could actually and I should actually more systematically collect all those uh, comments that I receive when I give those those lectures. Uh, I think I think this is in, this is important uh, in terms of impact yeah this is hard to judge what kind of impact uh, impact the book had has of course uh, First of all, you hope that people will read a book and this is becoming increasingly challenging. And I'm telling that as a person who's also teaching to, to the, the new gen, newer generations. And I must say how challenging I find it to make uh, younger people read books. Uh, so I'm actually very happy that this series exists and that it focuses our, our attention, as I said in the beginning, on actually stimulating people to read books and engage with ideas because of course in the book you have a lot more space to to develop ideas uh, and this book is also written within uh, a series and i think the series as a whole is also pushing uh, authors and contributors to actually uh, te test boundaries of concepts and test the, the usefulness of boundaries and engage in these questions about yeah differences and similarities between uh, migration and mobility and tourism and so so I think the series is very interesting how every book is actually exploring all this all those boundaries and I think as as with a lot of scholarship uh, scholarship and, and insights move slowly and it's always an accumulation uh, because you always build on on uh, the work of previous scholars and so it's it's like a build-up you know and it's uh, it would be very I think uh, arrogant to claim that one book totally changes the field because it, if that would be the case, it's thanks to all, all the previous work that has been done too. So I think uh, this is what we should be doing as, as scholars. And this is why in this book, I actually have very much also stressed not only uh, how I have insights from my field work, but how, how this is also very much embedded in and building upon uh, very old streams of of research and scholarship uh, because i think with now with so many scholarship being produced we oftentimes tend not to read anymore the older the older work because we don't have time and there's so much new stuff out anyway but i think it's very important to realize that uh, a lot of things which we may think are new have actually been thought thought about quite a while ago maybe using different work works and different frameworks uh, but I think I think it's important to keep uh, this connection and the building on all the scholarship alike. I would also want to add. First, I want to say that you know, as anthropologists, we are always aware, especially in the post-globalizing world, that fields are not you know the same. You go there after two years, and your field has changed. 
and not just the field, but also the field of study. But I very much agree with Noel when he says that actually we build upon the pre-existing work. And there is sometimes there is a tendency to see all this with the new lens and as if this is happening for the first time. But when you go back to older literature, you see people have already addressed these issues in different ways. So migration and mobility is not something that had just started in the last 20, 30 years, for instance. But I still feel that Noel's book really makes a, a lot of important con uh, contribution. Of course, we also, I mean, for example, reiterating the fact that flows and fixities cannot be seen as binary or the relationship of mobility and, and immobility. And there are quite many other things. The whole idea of imaginaries, for exa example, that's also very interesting that sometimes they proceed, sometimes they follow mobility. So I think it does make a lot of very important contributions. Thank you both. I see now a question. Uh, and a comment at the same time from uh, Patty Langton. Uh, I'm an old fashioned anthropologist who did field work in the 80s, living in a village in South Sudan. How do you categorize that kind of anthropology and travel now? It was performative. I did go back and I'm still in touch with the people. So perhaps, uh, Noel? Yes, this is something that I very briefly uh, mentioned, and I, I showed this one slide where I talked about, but I didn't really have time to basically elaborate on how actually also travel has played a key role in the development of anthropology as a discipline. And this idea of uh, moving anthropology from armchair uh, scholars to actually people who, who conduct field work. Uh, and who uh, used to spend quite a bit of time and unfortunately increasingly less and less because uh, younger generations ha have less and less time. They, ha they are supposed to finish their, their doctorates in very short times and also there's not enough funding. And so uh, this has, I think, very detrimental impacts on, on how we can, as anthropologists, how we can develop our, our insights. So I think there's a lot of value in, in going somewhere and spending a lot of time and also returning to places. Uh, because as uh, Sanam just said, places change, you change. And so it's, it, it's interesting to actually see those, those dynamics and to be able to, to, uh, to, to document them. So I think this is, this is very important and very valuable, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, for many people, it's increasingly difficult to actually engage in this type of fieldwork. I see it with, with a lot of our doctoral students. There, there's so much pressure and also now in this, the whole academic system has changed. Also many PhD students are now doing their PhD as part of larger projects, which, which already even limits you know, what they can be looking at. And so it's not anymore an anthropologist going somewhere, uh, spending time with people, uh, participant observation, and then seeing whatever is, is going on. I mean, it, it's much more directed and so it's, it's changing uh, anthropology, I think, in, in, in very important ways. And so this is something also that uh, we need to reflect upon. So, so how do we teach anthropology and how do we teach uh, what is needed to become an anthropologist, you know, and, and what, what is the role of fieldwork in training and what kind of fieldwork or fieldworks are possible? Uh, and it's, of course, it was even more dramatic over the last two years when with COVID, you know, when many people were not even allowed to actually uh, to travel uh, anywhere apart from virtual travel. Uh, and so it, it's raising it's raising very, very important questions. So I think uh, the, the field is is uh, is is moving, is changing in, in, in directions uh, and whether we like it or not, I think we, we have to think uh, how we can, yeah, uh, how it changes and basically anthropology. Thank you. And maybe Sanam, you have to add something? I don't know, I feel like I am somewhere in between. I did 
a 15 month long field work, but I see other students struggling with funding just for three years and pressure to finish. I mean, how are you going to do one, one and a half, two years of field work with that, you know? So it's a systemic issue. It's a problem at a larger level. And, but I truly appreciate the insight, the depth that, you know, a solid, good ethnographic field work can add the richness, the thickness. It's just nothing can actually compensate for that. Oh, yeah, I agree with you. I did a lot of field research um, in the late 80s, 90s, I beginning of this new millennium. And I keep returning to the places I did my film research. And as uh, Patty, I really enjoy being there and I'm in touch with the people. And it's very important for me, for my personal life, for my research. And talking about research, uh, where does this book take you to, uh, Noel? What's the next step? What do you think you should do? What did this book uh, ask you to ask yourself? Uh, what did the people uh, you met during your work uh, provoke you to, to do further? So do you mind sharing with us your ideas and uh, plans for the future? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So. As I explained, so so this book was was written as a way to to move from my early work on on tourism to this work on on mobilities. And so in this book, I'm clearly dealing with all kinds of 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 movements uh, and in engaging with 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 uh, existing scholarship. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, engaging with tourism scholars, migration scholars, mobility scholars, and other scholars, and. When, when writing this up, and I think once the book was published, I, I realized that there is one thing that is missing. And I'm, I'm hinting at it, uh, I think, in the chapter on, on the, the pilgrimage. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the importance of the body. And it's very interesting in, in how, how a lot of uh, the research on, on these movements, the, the body is often treated as an abstract entity. And so, as if the body is not affected at all by by moving and traveling and um, undergoing different climates eating different food and, and doing all kind of different things and this isn't this is something that i really uh, realized when i when i wrote this, this up that this was missing and so uh one of the things that i'm doing now and it's also about uh how how certain things are, are being valued how certain uh, ways of embodiment that are, are being valued. There's a little bit of research on that in, 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 in tourism. There's much less research on like migration, uh, like the, the experiences that the people who are arrived in Europe in 2005, uh, 2015, you know, the so-called refugee crisis and all these people are arriving uh, in Europe after weeks or sometimes months of traveling and traveling really as travail so a lot of effort and a lot of pain and a lot of impact also on the body and there's there's actually very little research on that also on actually the lasting effects of that because the body has a memory and so so what does it do with that and so uh, in my more more current research i'm really focused a lot on on mobilities and and looking at at the bodily aspects of that and uh, when we are talking about the body and, and, and the impact of travel, you of course have the close relation with also the environments through which people travel. And I think uh, nowadays it, it would be hard to, to do research on all forms of travel and not also think about you know, the, the impact of, of human travel on actually the wider environment. I mean, there's a debate of course of climate change, global warming, uh, all, all these type of things, but on a more profound level, also the the disconnection between uh, humans and the other parts of nature. I mean, the the fact that we have already this category of nature and that we have put ourselves outside of nature is very indicative. Uh, and so, these are kind of things that I'm ex uh, exploring right now. 
Thank you. And Sanam, uh, having read this book and having written a review, so did this book give you ideas about your own work in the future? Yes. Has it impacted your own approach? To Very much. To Actually, <clears throat> so in my own research, I sort of marry very different traditions, look at South Asian studies, literature on caste, literature on kinship, giving, gift giving, but also the newer literature under the whole, you know, uh, banner of transnationalism studies. And as such, I had not reckoned deeply, at least, with the whole literature that had started to come out after 2010 around the theme of mobilities. So reading Noel's book was really eye-opening in many ways and thinking how I could have used the lens of mobilities and not just mere migration and transnationalism in my own research. So that was really important. That was really enlightening. And I think I have since then written a paper that is still under review where I use this lens. So yes, in many ways, it has impacted my own personal uh, growth and journey as a scholar. So definitely, but I also want to ask a question to Noel. So when I started reading more about the whole literature on mobilities, it seems like first we had the problem of few and now we have a problem of plenty. So uh, in mobility studies, it seems like, you know, of course we needed a broader lens, a lens that is reflective of all the interconnections that just not look at physical mobility, but many interconnected mobilities that accompany physical mobility before and after. But now it seems, and perhaps I may be wrong, so perhaps you could add a corrective here. It seems like everything goes. Mobilities could be everything. And then, you know, we really do not know where to draw an analytical line. I'm not sure whether I'm reading it correctly, but I would really like to know how you feel about this. Yeah, like, like with- Wonderful with, question. Yeah, with, with many concepts when they become popular then they start being used in many different ways and i'm thinking about an, uh, the 1990s globalization was was a concept like this that's what that was used in so many different ways that it started losing its meaning because because it was applied to everything and the same thing is happening with with mobilities i see it now appearing in so many contexts meaning so many different things uh, and oftentimes without people really defining how how they understand the concept and so the reader is, is totally lost uh, but there was already a very early article uh, written by Peter Ade if if mobility means everything or, or, or if mobility is uh, yeah I think if mobility means everything then it's nothing uh, actually pointing out that that issue uh, but I think it's it's a typical problem when when a concept uh, catches on not not only within academia but also like in policy circles uh, there's so much on on mobility think of the whole eu uh, uh, frameworks where they talk about yeah, mobility and and migration and, and this is very interesting so they see clearly mobility and migration as different uh, uh, issues and and, and different uh, problems and so it's it's being used in, in in many different ways and so yet this is a problem and this is also why I always stress uh, when we are having conversations, particularly also interdisciplinary, that it's important that we each define, you know, all the participants should define how we understand concepts, because we often think that we are talking about the same thing, but in practice we aren't. And, and that's not even uh, considering the international context and issues of translation. You know, how do you translate concepts from different languages, uh, you know? Uh, these are these are uh, concepts that do not translate all that easily. Well, it's in a way like uh, finding out what is common sense in different countries, quite different idea of common sense. So we have one more question here from Hillary Cowan. Hello, Hillary. So nice to hear from you. As well as being an anthropologist, in the 90s, I worked with European student mobility programs. At that time, I was a fairly long voice, critical of the article of faith 
that mobility was increasingly a good thing. You mentioned that mobilities can have negative effects. Do you think a critical stance has entered the thinking of the administrators and policymakers of the European Union programs in the last few years? Yes, that's a very good question. And, and I would actually love to hear more about these experiences in the 1990s. Of course, the 1990s was at the very start of, of the Erasmus program, which had only started in 1987 which is actually quite late if you look at the history of the EU. That was because yeah, it was so difficult to set up this uh, mobility of people. Mobility of goods and money and objects seems to be much easier uh, than, than the mobility of, of, of people. Uh, and I think, I think I actually do believe that, uh, yes, the people involved in those programs have actually become aware of, of the fact that it's not uh, only a positive story, but that, it, that it's a complicated story, which has different uh, type of meanings and that there are also negative effects to it. But that has come, that has come later on and, and it has also come as a result of actually research being published actually about it. And that research came also rather late. Uh, and so it's as soon, I think, as this, this, this research was being published that also people in administration uh, became aware of these issues. And I think it's also somehow reflected in, in how these uh, programs are constantly being fine-tuned. Uh, and so I think this is a good, this is a good uh, development. And so it also points, of course, to the importance of when we have insights uh, that also the policymakers are, are one of uh, our, our uh, audiences i mean it should also be you know i mean we should also inform people who are actually uh, at the tables and who make decisions uh, also make them aware of, of uh, the kind of work that we do but this is the advantage of uh, myself living in in brussels and being very close to the <laughs> eu officials and <laughs> Uh, thank you. And uh, do you want to add uh, uh, anything, Sanam, your observations on this? Um, somewhat related to this, you know, I also had a question about mobilities and when the imaginaries of mobilities and not just the mobilities themselves can become debilitating in that they that people do not accrue any kind of social capital, but perhaps perhaps you can say negative capital, you know, uh, what would your reflections be on that? Well, I think the case of the of the Chileans is actually a, a relatively good example where actually in in a lot of of the the imaginaries that are circulating within Chilean society and it is slowly changing also because also the things are, are changing but there is this kind of a negative ring to it and also questioning why why that the, why this is necessary because if it's linked to accumulating social capital since there is uh, not a lot of social mobility it's actually it can work in a negative way and that's why uh, people people who actually uh, higher up the social ladder are are, are often uh, given the advice not to engage in these things because it may work against uh, maintaining or reinforcing their position and so uh, uh, but of course, it, it raises an interesting question of, of uh, what, what actually mobilities allow you to do, because of course, as I stated in the book, the original intention is often to return, because that's the situation that you know when you leave. But of course, in practice, uh, mobilities can also lead you elsewhere. They can lead you not to return, they can lead you to stay wherever you were going to, or they can lead you to actually move to yet another place. Uh, and this is, of course, something that is uh, not always considered when people start the process. Uh, they always start the process with the intention of I will go somewhere and then I return and then I take up you know, the life that I know. But of course, the whole experience of, of, of engaging in a mobility can and does change people. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, wonderful discussion. And perhaps, uh, I mean, maybe the time comes now to wrap up our meeting. 
Yeah, so it, it looks like there isn't more questions coming in, but please, um, if somebody wants to uh, come in still once more with a question, if somebody has come, come up with something, they want to use the opportunity uh, to ask our speakers, Noel and Sanam. Or if somebody wants to raise their hand, uh, we'll have a look at that as well. If somebody wants to comment uh, and say something about their own research um, and how it corresponds with the book or the themes that we're talking about. No. All right. I think uh, I think that means that we are at a good point to to wrap up our our meeting today. And uh, thank you for our audience for coming and listening to the conversation. We have these about uh, yeah once a month. The review meets reviewed, and we've put in the chat the next event uh, if you'd like to join us again. And uh, thank you so much to our speakers, uh, Noel and Sanam. Thank you for being here and um, giving us this opportunity to, to learn more. Thank you, Florentina, for sharing. And I'm going to, ah, there's a few messages here. Okay, Sean, he says thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Evelina, for coming. Great. <laughs> so I'm going to close the event now and hope to see some of you again uh, next month. Bye. Sure. <laughs> Bye-bye.